you can stand with me if you would, turn to the, um, <clears throat> the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians in chapter 8, we do have a food fellowship, everyone's welcome, uh, some really good stuff on the menu, so stick around for uh, a little bit of fellowship after the service, and i uh, love to visit with you, looking forward to that. Also, we do have bulletins, I failed to mention that. Uh, and the, our monthly bulletin is on the information table as well. Second Corinthians in chapter 8, Second Corinthians in chapter 8, we look here at verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, in beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Verse 7, therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye, through his poverty, might be made rich. Look at verse 11. And now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to what he hath not. Look, jump over to chapter 9. Look at the next chapter, chapter 9. Just flip it over, chapter 9. Notice it says, uh, for as touching, verse 1, the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia and a re was ready a year ago, and that your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boastings of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. Lest haply, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty. Verse 7. Verse 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And lastly, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that we see in this situation of two churches, two regions, and how your, your spirit of grace, your grace uh, was bestowed upon one group and it was a blessing to another. And I pray, dear God, that you would have grace upon Center Road Baptist Church. And Lord, we would enjoy that grace. We would experience that grace. Uh, we would, uh, uh, Lord, we would enjoy that and we would employ that grace, dear God. But we would also exhort others because of our testimony. So God, bless, uh, uh, bless us individually as we purpose in our heart on what to give towards missions, but Lord, also help uh, the church corporately. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. Maybe may be seated. Uh, we, we began this morning on the, the topic of <clears throat> uh, grace on us for others. Grace on us for others. And we saw, we saw and we discussed how grace... Uh, that subject is uh, such a powerful thing that the grace of God, as we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1, uh, by way of very, just quick review, I'm going to get into the new material momentarily, but it says here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Moreover, brethren, 
We do you to wit of the grace. We want you to know and see and witness the grace of God as it was bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. God specifically bestowed grace on the, the church in Macedonia. And then Paul says, well, let me, I want you to see that. I want you to know it. And, uh, and here is how it was manifest. Here is how it was evidenced. We talked about the evidence of the grace of God on the churches in Macedonia. And uh, we say, well, how, does, uh, how do we know that they had the grace of God, that God imparted to them something special that came on them, something uh, that uh, a supernatural power uh, that blessed them, that they were able to do above and beyond is because uh, of, their, uh, of their problematic circumstances. They were in great trial of affliction. They were in deep poverty. But even though they were under great pressure and burdens and persecutions and uh, they were pressed down and they were troubled on every side, they had financial problems, they had family problems, they had burdens and responsibilities, they were confused about the future, they didn't know what was going on, but somewhere in their hearts, uh, they still had a personal experience of the abundance of joy. Even in the midst of all the persecution and pain and problems and, and all those terrible things that, <coughs> that they, had, uh, they had joy. And, and that is how you know, amen, a real Christian that has the grace of God upon them. That in the moment of uh, persecution and problems and trials and pressures, they didn't break under the pressure. Because there's something there besides just their own psyche. There's something there besides their own mind and emotion and will. There's God there. There's the grace of God there. Amen? You know, it's like when, when we go through loss. And uh, the Bible says we are not those that, that sorrow without hope. Like we, we experience, uh, when a Christian faces loss, it is still painful to, to lose someone that we love. It's still, we go through the emotions, we go through the shock, we go through the trauma like anybody else. But somewhere along, the, uh, somewhere along the line, it's like in that dark haze and fog of emotion, there's a little lighthouse of hope. That we know there's a God. We know that there's a God that loves us. We know there's a God that cares for us. We know there's a supernatural God, the God that's all-powerful, that spoke the world into existence. Amen? And that God allowed that to happen. I don't know, understand why, but you know what? I'm still going to hope in that God. I'm still going to trust in that God. So we are, the, so yeah, I mean, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We go through problems, uh, saved people go through problems just like lost people do. But there's got to be a distinction. There's got to be something different. Amen? And some of that difference is the grace of God is evidenced uh, that our circumstances don't just define us. It's like it didn't define these Macedonian Christians. That in the midst of great poverty, uh, we see that uh, they experienced great joy. In the midst of great anguish and affliction and pain and pressure and problem, they still had joy and faith and trust. And we see here in verse 3 and 4 what an experience they had. For to their power, I bear record, yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. You say, well, why? How did they experience this supernatural power? Why did they experience? How do we know that this outward evidence, this outward proof, that they had the grace of God upon them. How do we know? How, how, what caused that? We see their sacrifice. Where it says they were willing of themselves in verse 3. We see in verse 5, they first gave their own selves to the Lord. There was that personal submission to God. Submission to his plan for your life. Submission to his per pre presence, his person. Submission to God in all of that. And uh, we see there's a supernatural power that becomes that. I mean, look, look at the uh, look what the Bible says about uh, in spiritual warfare or temptation, right? It says it doesn't just say resist the devil and he'll flee. I mean, I see, I hear some of these, you know, good night, man. Some of these TV charismatic guys. I'm not saying charismatics are all bad. Okay, I'm not just I'm not just lumping it, but some of these guys are. Devil, I'm putting you under my foot, devil. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, you know, uh, the Bible says, 
even the archangel Michael durst not bring a railing accusation against him. But you, preacher man, are going to you know, put the devil under your foot? Whoa, whoa, whoa. But you know what the Bible says? You know how we approach that? Not like that. But it says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee. He's not just fleeing because you're, you're boasting and you're huffing and puffing and you think you're important and you think you're spiritual. That's not, now. oh, oh, I'm afraid of this guy. Hardly. He's like, that's just the attitude of spiritual pride that's going to get me in with this guy. Amen? No, no, no. He, but when you submit to God, that's, he's like, whoa, whoa, it isn't you. It's the, it's the, it's the big God that's taking care of you. Amen? It's like a little kid who's, who's mouthy and all that. And in uh, and the, and the village, and the, bu- and the bully's ready to go face him on the street. But he comes and brings his six foot five older brother. Amen? That bully doesn't back down because that kid all of a sudden got big. And, but he, he brought somebody else that was bigger than him. Amen? So we bring along uh, that, that wonderful God who's powerful. And that's when the devil flees, when we submit ourselves to him. And these Macedonians submitted themselves to God. Now look here. This is where I want to pick up. Is, is what did they do? I mean, there was a, uh, a prop, the, the circumstances, they were problematic. The, the experience they had was personal, that they made a personal commitment to God and, and all that. And they had joy in the midst of problems. They had joy in the midst of, 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 uh, of poverty. You know, I remember talking to a waitress one time, and uh, they said, you know who's my more consistent, big, bigger tipper? It wasn't the wealthy person. They said there's something about, they said, you know what? It's other people that work service jobs just like me. That's what the waitress said. If they can identify, they know, hey, hey, I know you're hustling just like I am. And so even in their poverty, they had joy. Amen? But look what they did. Look at the powerful action that they did. Notice what it says. Look at verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, uh, I'm sorry, verse 2. How that in a great trial of affliction and abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. In the midst of all this, they had joy, but they gave. That word liberality, we would use the term generosity. They were generous. They gave money. I told you this morning about the offering that Paul was collecting as he was traveling to these churches around Asia Minor. He always said, hey, guys, let's remember uh, they're having a hard time back in Jerusalem. And that's that's where this thing all started. Amen. They're under persecution. They all you know, we all came out. Gentiles caught fire and all that. But let's remember those. Let's remember those Jewish folk in back in Jerusalem that are having a hard time that have family. So he went around in those collections and uh, and these Corinthians. Uh, they, they were boasting that they were going to do it. They didn't do anything. These Macedonians going through all of this, they're the ones that gave. They gave. Now, let me just, um, let me go over to Romans 15. Here's the proof of it. We see over there in Romans chapter 15, look at 26, Romans 15, 26. It says, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia. This is Paul, the same one who wrote the letter to the Corinthians also wrote the letter to the Romans. So he's testifying of the same thing, okay? For same author, verse 26. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So here he's testifying that they gave money, they participated in this offering to Jerusalem. But can I show you something special? This, this is kind of neat. Look over at 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians, this is a couple verses later, a couple chapters there. 2 Corinthians 11. And here, Paul, Paul was careful to say, hey, I'm raising money, I'm taking offering for these folks at Jerusalem. I'm not taking it for myself. He said, I am not going to be a debtor to anybody. Because remember, he, he, he made tents. Right? He, po- he said, I'm paying my own way. I'm not, no one's going to look at me and go, yeah, look at that guy. He's living off, high off the hog, all these offerings. He said, not me. Now watch. Look what he says here in 2 Corinthians 11. I robbed other churches, or uh, taking, uh, <clears throat> I, I, didn't, I think you need to read the verse before that, before I say that. 
wait a minute, you just said he didn't. Well, he said he did. Let me back up. <laughs> he said, um, but though I be rude in speech, ye not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Because they were challenging, they were criticizing him. So he's unfortunately having to defend himself. That's never happened before in Baptist churches. He said sarcastically. Verse 7, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. Hey, I didn't charge you anything. I came and preached the gospel. I didn't take an offering for myself. Now watch. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. He goes, other people paid for me, gave me offerings to come and serve you. I didn't take a dime from you. Now watch. Verse 9. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was, charge, I was, I, uh, um, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from where? Macedonia. Supplied. And in all things, I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you. Is that not good night? We're going to get into the Corinthians here in a minute. But isn't that amazing? I mean, I mean I'm going I'm to get in and tell you how Corinth was wealthy and affluent and all that. So here he is talking to this big, the, the big metropolitan church, right? The big city church with all the wealthy people in it. I mean, I mean remember, this is the Corinthians. And verse 11, they were the ones guilty of the wealthy people. Then they're bringing up here the man with the gold ring and escorting him up front, right? All you dirty people, you get, you get in the back when it was Lord's Supper time. And uh, so these are the Corinthians. They had some wealthy folk, and they were treating them. Uh, they were, they were uh, bowing the knee to them and special treating them over against others. And, and, uh, and, and, and here they've got these, these poor folk over in Macedonia. They're the ones providing for Paul to preach the gospel to them. So these Macedonians gave to Jerusalem, which was his main offering, but also gave to him so he can serve there in Corinth. Amen? It's amazing. that they. What a powerful action. The Bible says that they abounded in their liberality. They were generous in their giving. As much as they were joyful, they were generous. Now that's the Macedonians. Let's look quickly over at, because remember... Paul was utilizing the testimony of the Macedonians to exhort and, and uh, shame even the Corinthians. He wanted to exhort the Corinthians in using the evidence of the Macedonians as a rebuke and as an inspiration at the same time. He wasn't all just negative. You can see he's very loving in his, in his letter. He's not just bonking them over the head. He's lovingly challenging them from the testimony of the Macedonians. And uh, so stay with me. Look here at, at chapter 9 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 5. Because look here, because it, it says, verse 5 of chapter 9, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren. So I'm coming to exhort you guys. And I'm using the Macedonians to do just that. That they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, wherefore ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. He's like, I, I, I've had people to come go, to go ahead of me to uh, challenge them and be ready for the offering. Go in front of me. Go ahead of me. Make sure that when I get there, you are ready to go. <laughs> your wallets are open because you said this a year ago. The whole purpose in bringing up the example of them was to exhort them to do what they said they were going to do a year ago. Look just previous couple verses before that. Now, this is what's funny. Look at verse 2 of chapter 9. Verse 2. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. This is what's, this is what's wild and confusing. So he goes from Corinth, and he's saying, hey, guys, um, I'm going to take up an offering for those. There's a famine in Jerusalem, and let this be a blessing to all the brethren over there. Okay. Oh, man, we're, yeah, that's an awesome idea. That's great, Paul. Well, well, we'll give to you. We'll give to you every week, okay? Checks in the mail. 
Paul's like, okay, you guys are fired up. Yeah, we're fired up. Okay, I'm coming back. So then he, then he travels over from Corinth over to, over to Greece, Macedonia, northern Greece. And he goes, hey, guys, hey, uh, guys over here, listen. Hey, they're, they're, look, look, I'm taking up an offering for those in Jerusalem. You know, the, the, there's famine over there, and I'd like you guys to, you know, be a part of that. Man, that's great. He's like, and let me tell you something. I just came from Corinth, and they are fired up. They were swinging from the chandeliers, man. They were doing laps. They were ready to go. They didn't pay anything, but, man, were they excited. They're like, really? They were that pumped up? Let's go. And he said that I boasted of you to the people in Macedonia and Achaia, and that motivated them to give, and they gave. So now I'm coming back a year later, and he goes, I'm, and, and guess what? And he mentions it in that chapter. He goes, I'm bringing some guys with me from Macedonia. So if you don't want to embarrass yourself, you better be ready for this offering. So he's using these guys, he's using the Macedonians to challenge that. And, and let me tell you something, and this is a challenge to us. Again, it's not just about giving. It's not just about giving. This is about living. It's about grace living, not just grace giving. Amen? But the fact that they gave as one of the powerful examples and evidences and actions as an outward manifestation of the grace of God in their life, giving was only one thing. You don't think that they won their family to Christ in being joyful in the persecutions? You don't think that their testimony drew people to meetings where Paul preached and they got saved? Right? This is about grace living. Money is ter secondary and tertiary. So we look here, we look at the Corinthians, and the Corinthians had the same situation, if you would. Um, I mean, it's different, but it's the same circumstances. Now watch. So let's look at the Corinthians' problematic circumstances. We look here in, uh, in 8.24. Notice it says here in 8.24, it says, Wherefore show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and our boasting of your behalf. He goes, I need to see proof. I need to see the evidence of the grace of God on you, just like we saw evidence of the grace of God on the Macedonians. I'm going to see the proof that you really love God, that you really love these, these folks in Jerusalem, that you, really love, uh, um, that you really love God and you're willing to give, and that your boasting was not in vain. I need to see proof of that in this offering that you said you were going to give a year ago. Now watch. So they had the same proof and evidence just like the Macedonians did. Now watch. So let's look back at verse 10 of uh, chapter 8. I'm sorry, I'm flip-flopping, 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 8. <clears throat> if you don't have a Bible, I do apologize. I should have it up here, but uh, um, so this is kind of a, a, I'm sprawling over two chapters here, but stay with me. In uh, 2 Corinthians 8, let me read it to you, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 10, it says, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. And I've already, I'm not going to spend time on this, I've already said it. But their, their problematic circumstances, a year ago they said, hey, I'm going to do it, and now they haven't done it, so they've got a problem. They're not doing what they're told. They're not doing and following through with what they, were, they said they were going to do. So that's what their circumstances are. They're not, dealing, they're not dealing with the Macedonians. They're not dealing with persecution and all that. They've got some freedom in, in their city. They've got some wealth and ability and upward mobility there. Uh, they, they don't have the same situation Macedonians are going through. They don't have that kind of circumstances, but they've got some problems. They've they got some problems to follow through and say what they were going to do. That was their problem. And then look at their personal. Now watch this. Stay with me. They, look, what is their personal experience? Their personal experience is this. They were the most gifted church in the entire New Testament era. In any New Testament church, they were the most gifted church. Like, what do you mean by gifted? Remember, this is the same church that 1 Corinthians is written to. So let's go back there for just a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, before you go there, look at verse 7. I'm sorry. Before we, we jump back there, look at chapter 8 and verse 7. Chapter 8 and verse 7. Now watch. So, this, so the Macedonians, they had, an, they had an experience of joy in the midst of deep poverty and affliction. 
But these, now, uh, these Corinthians, look at this. I mean, look at their experience. Now, stay with me. There's a point here. Verse 7. It says, therefore, as ye abound, that's the key word there, because he's contrasting. He said, boy, these Macedonians, they abound in poverty. They, 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 they abound in liberality. They abound in giving. They're generous in the midst of their poverty. He said, but what you abound in, now look at this. Look, what are they abounding in, in verse 7? In everything. You've got everything. You've got everything, he said. Now look, verse 7. You, boy, you abound in everything. You abound in faith. You abound in utterance. That is like speaking in languages, utterances. You abound in knowledge. That's the gift of knowledge, the word of knowledge, the ability to interpret. In the New Testament at that time, we would gather together and, uh, and maybe uh, uh, Doug would have a, uh, uh, or Brian, I'm sorry, Brian Dugan, I get your Doug, eh, I, I get, it was a hybrid of your both names. Um, maybe Brian's like, I, I, get a, I get a word of knowledge, and he stands up and says, boy, you know, uh, we got to pave this pavement, Amen. Or he's going to speak in tongues or something, right? An unknown tongue, then unknown to us. It's a known language, but an unknown to us. And then uh, uh, Miss Patty over here goes, I got the gift of interpretation. I'm going to get up and I'm going to interpret that. And what that means is God is saying, Send Row Baptist Church, what we need to do is give money for the pavement. And that's how it went. That's how the, and by the way, all that I just said is described in the New Testament. I don't have time to go th- for time's sake into 1 Corinthians because they were, it, was, it was wildfire going on in the, the church of Corinth. It was crazy. Now they had gifts. They had so many gifts. They were just, it was like overflowing, right? I mean, they had everyone, everyone was speaking in tongues and word of knowledge and they, they were all over the place. People had gifts of giving and administration. They, had, they, were, they were the most gifted church. But they're the ones that didn't give any money. Do you understand? Over there, these are poor and hurting, and, but they were joyful in their simplicity, and they're the ones giving. But this church over here, they didn't abound in anything. They didn't abound. In, they abounded. They had everything. They, had, they abounded. They had people that had faith and utterance and knowledge and an all diligence. Man, you were getting busy doing the things that God wants you to do. Now watch. Except for the idea of giving. Now watch. And in your love to us, in all of that, look, he says, see that ye abound in this grace also. And that's the grace of giving. That's what he's identifying is this gift here. Yeah, you know what? You've done all these things, but you're still, you're still falling short over here. So stay with me. So this is, if we, if we stop over here and go back to 1 Corinthians 12 really quick, we see that this is the most gifted church. The most gifted church. I mean, uh, in 1 Corinthians, in verse 12, it just goes on about, uh, by all these work at the... It, it's a whole list of all the different gifts. And they had them. And, he, and, and he's putting them in... And he's giving them counsel about how to administrate the gifts that they had in abundance. Okay? He's talking about verse 4. Diversities of gifts, the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There's diversities of operations, but is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit. So he, he's talking to this group of people, and uh, that they are full of faith, full of utterance, and they have all these gifts. But they're falling short in this grace, this particular grace, the grace of giving. And then lastly, let me say this. What is their powerful action? It's actually not the powerful action like the Macedonians, but it's actually an impotent action. It was their, it was their actionless without power. It's the opposite. So let's go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 11. It says, Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. 
You see, there's different, you see, now, now check this out. Because this is where faith promise giving is, I have a broad brush with that term. Because he, no, he, he, the Macedonians didn't give what they had, they gave out of what they didn't have. They gave beyond their power, beyond their resources. But he's saying, you guys, you got good 401ks and you got savings account. You got Dave Ramsey go, going on for you over here in Corinth. And, and, and you know, Dave Ramsey will help you uh, find money in your budget, but God will help you find money in your heavenly rewards. Amen. <laughs> but, but the Corinthians, they, they had money. So he's saying, listen, listen, when, when I'm challenging you to give, it's give out of what you have. You're just being, you're just being stingy. I mean, you're all faithful and your services are great and you got gifts and all that, but you're being stingy on God. So you ought to give out of what you have. But those Macedonians, they gave beyond their power. They gave what they didn't have. Same grace, same God, but different. It, it, it's different for you and me. My situation's not what your situation is. Are you listening? So when God pours his grace out on you, the proof or manifestation of that is going to be different in your life than it is in my life. Amen? Does that make sense? And we look at chapter 9 and verse 1 and 2. For as touching the ministering to the saints, and that's this ministering to the saints is this offering for Jerusalem. He says, I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you of, to them of Macedonia that Achaia was ready a year ago and that your zeal hath provoked many. You know, you are, um, and he said this, and then here's the, I, I love this phrase down in verse 6 and in chapter 9, and I'm, and I'm finishing up here in or, uh, chapter 9 and verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. You see, when it comes to that, that's whatever God and you and you purpose in your heart between you and God. That has nothing to do with anyone else. Someone may come up here and go, I'm going to even this my Whoa, he's given that much. I better go change mine. It's whatever God impacts you and challenges you because that's the grace of God on your life. And that's how. Um, you are to give. Can I just finish this last point? You see, it's the exhortation is for the Corinthians to finally give and step out and give and make up for what they lack. But notice the example is verse 9. I'm not even going to preach it. I'm just going to read it. Because the real example of all this is not the Macedonians. What's the real example? It's Christ. That's the real example. Look at verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 8. Notice it says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, oh, what's his problematic circumstances? He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. He enjoyed eternity in the glories of heaven. But he came down it was born in a manger, in a, in a cave, to a bunch of on the other side of the tracks people. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth, amen. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So he, became, he was rich, but he became poor. So his, his circumstances now is he became poor. Remember he said, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. He became poor. And what is his personal experience? Now watch. Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. He came and he decided to be rich in grace, not rich in wealth. Are you listening? Jesus became rich in grace. So now when we trust in him to be saved, he dispenses that grace to us to be saved. And then his, what's his powerful action? Through his poverty, we become rich. That's all spiritual stuff. That's we are rich in his grace. So the Macedonian, 
lessons. They're a great example. They're a great exhortation to the Corinthians. But the real example is Christ. Amen? Because by grace, by his grace, are we saved. There was um, on the New Hebrides Island was John Patton. John Patton was a missionary from Glasgow, Scotland. For 10 years, he labored in this one particular island. And he worked amongst cannibals. And those cannibals, boy, they, um, they hated him. And they, they committed uh, a cult and witchcraft against him. One uh, gentleman said, how could you go amongst the cannibals? You'll be eaten by them. And John Patton, the missionary, the great missionary, famously replied, um, I, may as well give, I may as well give my life for Christ since in the end this body will rot in the ground. In 1858, he sailed there to work amongst the Tana, the people of Tana, who were the cannibals. Now listen to me very carefully. His wife died within the first year. And as he was laboring, many were, were, were attacking him constantly. But they saw that he had this grace still in the midst of losing his wife. He still labored. There was a time there he labored for, uh, for four years. And he went back and uh, his wife died of malaria. He had malaria, but he still survived. And he went back and on furlough in 1862 and, and uh, went to a number of countries and recruited people, met a young lady and, uh, and married her and uh, came back and to labor again. And many never forgot the testimony that he had when he was down and out when his wife died. But he still showed that he had joy. He still showed that he had the grace of God in his life. And that won many to Christ. Amen? Let's all stand.